recording. Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. We're happy to have you in here today. I see so many familiar names and I, I wanna tell you how grateful I am that you find value in what we do. It's, it's humbling to me and it's really a source of pride that you continue to listen to our educational content. And those of you who are new, if you like what we do and what you hear today, I hope you will join us again and tell your friends. Uh, you can always find our calendar at carepatrol.com uh, look under the advisors, look for me, Sean Barnes, uh, and you'll see down that page a listing of topics for each month and a registration link. I've also included a registration link in uh, to the chat room. If you're unfamiliar with the chat room, uh, you can access it by either moving your cursor to the top of your screen or the bottom, a black band should pop up, and on that band is the word chat click on that. You also have the option, each of you, to unmute and join the discussion and certainly hope you will use the chat room, uh, if nothing else, to, uh, to uh, introduce yourselves and share ideas and form a community. So welcome in to those of you who are joining us here. You're joining Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Um, we are a placement agency, which means that we depend on folks like you, social workers and nurses who work in a discharge setting or clinical setting in which they come across aging folks uh, who may be in need of assistance, if nothing else, education about what the options are looking down the road five to 10 years. We are at no charge to our clients. We're paid by providers in our network uh, sort of like a realtor. And I, I sometimes joke that we're sort of the marriage, Care Patrol is sort of the marriage of social work and real estate in that we try and find and, and offer as many resources to our clients as we can. And then when we're looking for communities, if that's the option that makes sense, then we drive our clients around like a realtor does and we tour properties with them. Uh, and this is all at no charge to them again. And it's how we uh, like to serve our aging population, and we hope that you will refer to us uh, when you come across folks who need help. Let's get into housekeeping. We still have people coming in, uh, but I want to go ahead and let everyone know, particularly those of you who are new, that we're accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work Examiners and also by the Alabama Board of Nursing Practitioners. And each of them give us the ability to create and credential and offer to you credit hours via Zoom that are considered to be face-to-face -face or live hours. And this, as you know, makes a difference when you go to renew. So we are accredited by the ABN and the ABSWE, um, and we are a live uh, seminar because that we our evaluation is password protected. So we don't uh, give out the password until later today, we will give out the password. Uh, but our survey uh, after the event is password protected. Uh, and by giving the password late in the presentation then the boards of nursing and social work know that we were both here together, that you were attentive and hopefully gain something from today. Some of you are participating by phone, I know, or are not in front of a screen. I'm gonna read for you the evaluation link uh, a couple of times. So please uh, have a pen or paper handy or a note uh, up in your phone. Today's link is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters B as in boy, G as in girl, G as in girl, S 
five W Z as in zoo. One more time. I know we've had a few people still entering. If you're listening uh, by phone and not able to see the screen, I'm going to read one more time the evaluation link for today's presentation. It is through SurveyMonkey. The link is, if you'd care to make note of it, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters, B as in boy, G as in girl, G as in girl, S, five, W, Z as in zoo. I've also posted this in the chat room. Uh, everyone here is free to join the chat. And Adrian, Ms. Ward, thank you so much for posting that again for us. Uh, all of you who participate on a regular basis are, are so thoughtful and kind, and I appreciate uh, what you do for me in this hour, in addition to what you do for others 24-7, 365. So let's get started with today's topic. And again, all September, we're going to address mental health. Friday, we'll address uh, self-harm disorders. Today, we're going to address mindfulness interventions for depression and anxiety. And on the evaluation, in addition to other questions, you'll be asked if we met these objectives. The first is define the problem of anxiety and depression in the US. Uh, the second objective is to briefly discuss and define mindfulness. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with that as a concept or a term, uh, although I expect you probably are. Then objective three, we're going to learn a meditation exercise uh, that you can use to intervene if you have anxiety or depression or have clients or children or parents or anyone that you may assist. I think you'll find this a worthy uh, exercise for you and they. So I'm going to ask you all, uh, you know, I like to get you started chatting in the chat room or again, you can unmute if you like. What do you all think? might be a common theme between anxiety, depression, and co-related disorders. So if you have a thought on that, what do you think might be a common theme between anxiety, depression, and co-related disorders? Gail Thrasher says mental illness and addiction. That is certainly true. That is a common thread, if not theme in my sense. Stress, Daphne, I think you're absolutely right on the point with that answer. Stress is a component of anxiety, as we'll learn shortly. And I appreciate anyone else's opinion on the topic. Uh, and if you're new to us, to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, I love to get y'all involved. I'd like to have you uh, chat in the chat room and share your ideas and gain something from your colleagues in addition hopefully, to gaining something from us. Uh, stress, one's health, Jamie Thompson says, uh, all, good, all good answers and all true. So what we see then, oh, excuse me, I went up one. What we see is that stress is something that, that everyone experiences. We all experience stress. Some of you may have been in a stressful situation today already. So everyone experiences stress. The difference in stress in anxiety is that stress is a response. And it's a response to a specific perceived threat or situation. Stress is situational. Anxiety is a reaction to that stress. And anxiety is omnipresent. It is not situational, it is constant for many who suffer from it. And so what we see then is that anxiety disorders are the most common illness in the US. 40 million adults, 18 and older, 19% of our population suffer from some form of anxiety disorder. And these are highly treatable. 
And yet only about 37%, 35%, somewhere in that area, only about 37% of the people actually ever seek treatment for their anxiety disorder. Uh, and those who don't are three to five times more likely to see a physician for some other related illness, to your point, Jamie. And they're six more times likely to, uh, to be hospitalized. And in this case, it's many times in a behavioral unit in which they're hospitalized. And we don't know truly where anxiety forms, but what we know is that it's complex uh, and that risk factors for it include genetics, uh, your brain chemistry, which you know has changed in your life and can change again, and personality and life events. All of these contribute to anxiety for us. The most, or one of the more common, not the most, one of the more common uh, anxiety disorders is generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. It affects 6.8 million adults, about 3% of the population and less than half only about 43% are receiving treatment according to the National Institutes for Mental Health. Now women are two times as likely to be affected with generalized anxiety disorder as men. And we see very often when someone has GAD, they also have a major depressive disorder. Good afternoon, Katrina Wilson. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, panic disorder affects 6 million adults, about almost three, a little short of 3% of the population. And again, women are twice as likely to be affected by panic disorder as men. And then there's one that I think certainly is, is one that I have maybe more empathy for because I feel like I may have it, uh, at least in some little strain of it, social anxiety disorder which affects 15 million adults, about 7% of the US population. And it's equally common among men as women. Typically, the social anxiety disorder or SAD begins at around age 13, which is of course for, you know, on the average, the onset of puberty. And in a 2007 ADAA survey, 36% of the folks who were receiving treatment said they had been experiencing symptoms of this anxiety disorder for 10 or more years prior to seeking treatment. Now, there are also specific phobias. They affect 19.3 million adults. Women are twice as likely, again, to be affected as men, and symptoms typically begin in childhood. The average age of onset is seven. And of course, phobias are, are not truly anxiety, but we include them here. Uh, one of the more popular, or not popular, <laughs> one of the more prevalent uh, anxiety disorders is separation anxiety at 6.6% of the U.S. And this is these are people who have a fear or anxiety around losing uh, someone or something or some set of things. And this is where you, you would think of these folks, hoarders are likely suffering from separation anxiety, as is my daughter's six-week-old puppy, who you may hear crying in the background. Now, as we move through other anxiety disorders, we look at obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, again, closely related to anxiety disorders. And some may experience anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder and depression at the same time, OCD affects about two and a half million people. Uh, women, three times more likely than men. Average age of onset with obsessive compulsive disorder is 19, uh, and that's about 25% uh, uh, are, are at age 14 who develop the disorder, and one third of affected adults first experienced 
symptoms in childhood. A PTSD affects 7.7 million adults. This is 3.6% of the US population. Women are five times more likely than men to suffer PTSD. Rape is the most likely trigger of PTSD. 65% of men who have been raped and 45% of women who have been raped will develop PTSD. And childhood sexual abuse is a strong predictor of lifetime PTSD. And I want to stop for a moment because I believe the majority of you on the phone are women. And I want you to listen as I continue to say statistics that affect people in the anxiety disorder spectrum and how women are more likely to suffer these. And I want you to do some soul searching today and after we uh, hang up, so to speak. Now, many people with anxiety disorder also have a co-occurring physical illness, as we mentioned there. Uh, five times more likely to go to the doctor, or a co-occurring disorder. Uh, we have adult ADHD, bipolar, uh, body dysmorphic. These are obviously folks that are anorexic or, or bulimic, eating disorders, fibromyalgia, headaches, IBS, sleep disorder, substance abuse. So people with anxiety disorder are likely have one of these co-occurring, which naturally makes the symptoms worse and the recovery more difficult. And in order to recover, it is essential to be treated for both conditions or every condition which it applies. Anxiety disorders affect 31.9% of adolescents between 13 and 18. One in three. Untreated teenagers with anxiety disorders are at higher risk to perform poorly in school, miss out on important social experiences like the homecoming dance, engage in substance abuse. This was someone's answer earlier when we talked about uh, what we thought might be a link between anxiety and depression. And these anxiety disorders in kids, uh, typically like adults, co-occur with other disorders, including depression and eating disorders and ADHD. And here's the thing, there's a little respite here in our middle age, but anxiety is as common, one in three, among older adults as among the young. And generalized anxiety disorder is the most common among older adults. Uh, which makes sense if you have a sense of the unknown in the front of you uh, and the fear of the unknown in the front of you, which is the aging process and the mortality of our bodies and the continuation of our spirits. These would cause uh, many of us to have GAD, but in adults and the older adults, these are also often associated with people who've fallen and now maybe have a, a hyperactive fear of falling or have had an acute illness and are uh, loath to leave the house. So what a major, uh, excuse me, adjustment disorder is one type of major depressive disorder. Are you familiar with it or are you familiar with others that are part of a major depressive Disorder, adjustment disorder is one type of major depressive disorder. Are you familiar with it or are you familiar with other types of major depressive disorder? I hope to see your answers in the chat room and I'll continue with the presentation. 264 million people worldwide live with depression. That's almost the population of the United States, about 60%, 70% of the population of the U.S. Ms. Thrasher, you are familiar with adjustment disorder. I'm glad. Yes, Keldon Jones, you are. Thank you for being back, Keldon Jones. I remember you as a, as a, 
as a new person not long ago, and I don't know you, Ms. Hoskin, but welcome here. Amy Harvey, thank you for being here. Around 17.3 million adults who are 18 and older in the USA experience at least one major depressive episode in the last year. Trauma. That's six and a half or almost 7% of the adults in the U.S. Oh, Val, you've, you've gotten ahead of us. I didn't expect such a detailed answer. And she's nailed it for y'all. Major depressive disorder is two weeks or more and persistent depressive disorder is two years or more. Uh, and we'll address that in a moment. Thank you for bringing that to our attention there. As you know, all there are different types of depressive disorders and they all have their own unique systems. Major depressive disorder is characterized by having at least five of nine common symptoms. And one of those symptoms must be either an overwhelming feeling of sadness or loss, or a loss of interest in living your life, in the activity of daily living that is your life. So if you have one of those symptoms, and then uh, four of these remaining, which is a decrease or increase in appetite, insomnia or hypersomnia, psychomotor agitation or retardation, constant fatigue, feelings of worthlessness or excessive and inappropriate guilt, recurrent thoughts of death and suicidal ideation with or without a specific plan and cognitive difficulties such as diminished ability to think, concentrate, and make decisions. We've done a CEU on the similarities of dementia to depression, and it is in this cognitive dysfunction, the inability to think, reason, and make decisions that we see that likeness. Now, for major depressive disorder, as uh, Ms. Corner said, symptoms must persist for two weeks or longer, and represent a significant change from previous. Persistent depressive disorder or dysthmia, uh, the essential feature of this is just a low, dark, persistent mood, present most days for most of the day and having occurred for at least two years. Now in children and adolescents, this is only one year that we need to see this uh, occurrence in order to make the diagnosis. And in addition to this mood uh, and this persistence for two years, we should also see in someone who has persistent depressive disorder, or PDD, we should also see that they have a poor appetite or they're overeating. They have insomnia or hypersomnia, low energy or fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentration, difficulty making decisions or feelings of hopelessness. And their symptom-free intervals last no longer than two months. The symptoms are not as severe as with major depression, uh, but major depression will often precede and, and provide the onset of the persistent depressive disorder, or it may occur during. So depression includes premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is severe and sometimes disabling. It is an extension of premenstrual syndrome, PMS, but the mood changes in PMDD are more acute and severe than those in PMS, so much so that it can disrupt someone's social obligation or professional life or other important area of functioning. Uh, and both usually begin at about the same time, about seven to 10 days before the start of the menstrual period and continue for the first few days of the period. Both may also cause breast tenderness, bloating, fatigue, and changes in sleep and eating. But PMDD is more severe. It has more severe emotional and behavioral symptoms such as a sadness or hopelessness 
including anxiety, potentially, uh, tension, moodiness, and anger. Um, and some other medical conditions may trigger a depressive symptom, although I'm not sure that it's fair to say that menstruation is a medical condition. That seems untrue. Um, depressive disorders due to other medical conditions may include those who have endocrine issues, um, who uh, have reproductive system disorders, low thyroid hormone levels or hypothyroidism. Uh, and then uh, usually when we treat hypothyroidism, we see depression uh, enter the client. Cushing syndrome, another hormonal disorder, caused by cortisone. We have discussed the effect of cortisone, or excuse me, cortisol, on depression. Uh, it tends to a build up of it cause depression. I think it also leads to some dementias. At least there's studies that show this. And it has been shown to even contribute to diabetes and stroke. And then we look at adjustment disorder with a depressed mood, which I asked you about earlier. So it's diagnosed when symptoms of depression are triggered within three months of a stressor. When stressors typically involves a change of some type, uh, and sometimes it can even be a positive change, like an impending marriage or a pregnancy or a new job. And so the stressor is not necessarily in and of itself a negative event or a traumatic event. It can be a positive event that causes stress. It's, but the distress one feels with adjustment disorder is out of proportion to the external stimuli, to the expected reaction. Uh, and the symptoms cause significant distress and impairment. They can paralyze someone who is suffering from that condition. But when the stressor is removed, then the disorder tends to lift. So the treatment time is fairly limited and relatively simple. And so I'll answer my own question. In my thinking and in my research, I believe, that the common theme to anxiety and depression is an inability to enjoy life because in both cases, they inhibit our ability to enjoy our life, to enjoy our present moment because we are so racked with guilt or shame or uh, you know, fatigue or anger or whatever, you know, series or litany of emotions that we may be experiencing, we're not in the present, we're reliving, rehashing, ruminating. Uh, so anxiety and depression to me, the common theme is an inability to enjoy life. So what does mindfulness mean to you? Do you know the word or the concept? Are you familiar with mindfulness? Have you heard about it before? What does it mean to you? If you're comfortable, please always, as always, uh, use the chat room and share with us your thoughts on what you think mindfulness means uh, or what it means to you, not what it means to the world, but what it means to you. What does mindfulness mean to you? And as you think about that, and you may respond, uh, I'll move forward. Mindfulness Amy Harvey says, being aware of one's feelings and engaging in activities that help us to manage those feelings. I like that, Amy. Brittany Phillips says, a practice of staying in the moment intentionally. That's correct. Mindfulness, in fact, uh, Brittany Phillips, is a stark contrast to much of our common experience. In fact, our default mode of attention is non-attention. Our mind wanders. It's as, as if our mind is, is on autopilot and, and, and working without us. And we sometimes joke, oh, my, my mind moved before I thought about, or my, I spoke before I thought or something to that effect. So when we, we focus on internal experiences in the present moment, 
We are often filled with self-critical self-talk. We've talked about self-talk and self-care in a previous CEU. And when we get into ruminative, which is my word I think I learned from Keldon Jones, uh, or otherwise worrisome thoughts and emotions, which we then attempt to suppress. In fact, recently 11 laboratory studies with healthy adults found that most people chose to do a series of mundane tasks, and even some chose to receive mild electric shock instead of being left alone with their thoughts. Gail Thrasher, living in the present instead of the past or the future, embracing what is going on in your life now. Totally agree, Ms. Phillips. Thank you all for participating. I love it when you share yourselves with, with me and with others. Uh, and so mindfulness refers to a process that leads to a mental state that's characterized by non-judgmental awareness of the present, including one's sensations, thoughts, bodily states, consciousness, the environment around the person. And while in this non-judgmental awareness of the present, they are seeking an openness and a curiosity and an acceptance of what is there. Mindfulness is the practice of purposefully bringing one's attention to the present moment without evaluation. And this is most often the skill that can be developed through meditation, although there are other training methods as well. Clinical psychology and psychiatry have developed a number of therapeutic applications based on mindfulness. And this has been done since the 1970s, we're 50 years. Mindfulness-based approaches are a major subject of increasing research. There are 52 papers published on it in 2003, 477 in 2012. Two years later, nearly 100 randomized controlled trials have been initiated and published. Mindfulness practice has been shown in these studies to reduce depression, to reduce stress, to reduce anxiety, and as an effective treatment for drug addiction. It can be applied to aging issues, weight management, athletic performance, uh, special needs issues, and even in the perinatal period. So studies have been done across these arenas with all types of patient populations, and the results have been staggeringly positive and the same across. A large study found recently that 47% of our waking hours, half of our waking life is spent in a state of our mind wandering. The author of that study demonstrated that this mind wandering was a predictor of subsequent unhappiness and also show that in contrast that the capacity to keep focused on the present was associated with a higher psychological well-being and all studies will show that mindfulness itself is difficult to achieve but ultimately beneficial across multiple fronts uh, it is what is known in the cognitive science as a desirable difficulty, meaning that it is a task that requires some expenditure of your cognitive resources, but that the result of that expenditure is a higher cognitive flexibility, greater insight, and better self-regulation abilities. The research that we've seen has done uh, focused on the effects of mindfulness using neuroimaging techniques. This was in Frontiers in Psychology, the publication. The neural perspective research of how mindfulness meditation works suggested that mindfulness exerts components of attention regulation, body awareness and emotional regulation on the body so that one gains aspects such as sense of responsibility, authenticity, 
compassion to someone's point earlier, self-acceptance and character, and it increases our sense of self and identity. So mindfulness-based intervention, which is what we are looking at today, or MBIs, have been shown to work via changes in specific areas or aspects of psychopathology, such as cognitive biases, affective dysregulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. The most common MBIs are mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, or MBCT. And all mindfulness-based interventions have demonstrated efficacy in reducing anxiety and depression, consistently outperform non-evidence-based treatments and active control conditions, such as psychotherapy alone, and also perform comparably well to those folks who are undergoing cognitive behavior therapy, which we have discussed in previous CEUs. And yet mindfulness or mindfulness-based interventions are compatible with CBT. Here at the bottom of the screen, for those of you who can see it, there are now mindfulness apps. This is one of them. Um, and if you can write it down and click on it, you could have an app on your phone that reminded you to do things to keep you mindful, like breathing meditation for one. MBSR was developed by John Cabot Zinn. You may have heard the name at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And according to John Cabot Zinn, mindfulness may be beneficial to many who are unwilling to adopt Buddhist traditions or vocabulary. So I wanna say that again. Mindfulness may be beneficial to many unwilling to adopt Buddhist traditions or vocabulary. In other words, you need not uh, you know, forsake your religious practice or belief or value in order to participate in meditation. Being a Buddhist, is not a prerequisite. MBSR uses a combination of mindfulness meditation, which is based on the Buddhist meditation, uh, the Vipassana meditation that the Buddha uh, himself taught, but it, it's rooted in this spiritual teaching, but the program itself is secular. And it's widely been adopted or programs based on MBSR have widely been adopted in schools and prisons with VA centers, hospitals, other environments, and again, had resounding, resounding success. The MBSR is an eight week treatment program uh, and it's aimed to reduce stress uh, through enhancing the mindfulness skills of the participant through regular meditation. So it's weekly two to two and a half hour group-based meditation classes, and then audio guided home practice about 45 minutes a day. And then the last or sixth week, there is a day long mindfulness retreat. Uh, and the course content is focused on how to mindfully attend to body sensations using various mind-body meditative practices such as sitting meditation, body scans, gentle stretching, and yoga. And then they offer group classes in which discussion uh, ensues about how to apply these processes, this mindfulness that they're learning into their lives. It was initially created to, to assist with chronic pain, but has since been applied to many populations of clients, including, and in our case specifically here, psychiatric. Um, it is something that meets compliance. So we've talked about the uh, lack, uh, when we talked about the high cost of medication, we talked about one of the high cost is the lack of non-compliance. Uh, this is not something that people are not compliant with. When people learn mindfulness meditation, it's something they tend to adhere to because it works. So we see with mindfulness meditation, with these 
mindfulness-based interventions, that the gray matter in our brains that regulate emotion and processing and learning and memory have shown changes in density following MBSR. In fact, the practice is associated with improvement of the immune system. It explains or could explain the correlation between stress reduction and increased quality of life, which we know to be true. Uh, we see that it is a result of the thickening of the prefront prefrontal cortex, which is our executive functioning, and our hippocampus, which is our learning and memorization ability. And then it shrinks our amygdala, which is our emotional and stress response uh, you know, system in the brain, and strengthens the connection between our brain cells. Long-term meditators have larger amounts of gyrification, which is a quote, folding of the cortex, which allows the brain potentially to process information faster. And long-term meditators have larger amounts of this gyrification than people who don't meditate. And there is a distinct correlation between the amount of gyrification and number of meditation years, possibly providing further proof of the brain's neuroplasticity. Before I go, I, wanna, I don't want to let this comment go. Ms. Thrasher says, I think prayer can also be helpful for mindfulness for those with a Christian tradition. And I completely agree. And I would even say that the two are one and the same. The prayer to our Christian God is no different than mindfulness meditation and focus on the present moment, in my belief. Uh, both bring us closer to truth. The most widely researched adaptation of MBSR is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Now, this was developed by John Teasdale, Zendal Siegel, and Mark Williams, and it was intended to prevent the relapse of major depression. So MBCT, combines elements of mindfulness training and cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, to reduce depression recurrence. Mindfulness principles are applied uh, and people learn to try and accept the world without an immediate judgment. This enhanced internal awareness then helps them to disengage from these maladaptive coping patterns of thinking and acting which they have formed over the years. And the, the classes in MBCT sort of follow the same course. It's eight weeks like MBSR. There's you know day work and homework. And the treatment outcomes have found that it may be the most effective treatment in preventing relapse with the greatest possibility for no potential future relapse. So as we said, it was combined, designed to prevent relapse of depression, it combines cognitive behavior therapy with mindfulness meditation. Uh, and it has worked for people who have had historically had depression and then become distressed. If they can return to these automatic cognitive processes that triggers a depressive episode in them, MBCT interrupts that automatic trigger automatic process and teaches, we think, the participant to focus less on reacting to the stimuli and focus more on accepting non-judgmentally the stimuli. And then it allows that participant moving forward to begin to notice when these automatic processes are occurring and alter their reactions. And research shows that MBCT has reduced relapse rates of major depressive disorder by 50%. The most comprehensive review to date examined 209 trials and results indicated that MBIs are more effective in reducing psychological and medical symptom severity than other therapies or suppression techniques. Uh, it was the strongest when dealing with issues of anxiety, but also works for depression. 
and the patients remain stable upon follow-up. So mindfulness-based dialectical behavior therapy was developed by, and we've talked about this at another CEU, dialectical behavior therapy was created by Marcia M. Linehan, uh, and she developed it specifically to treat borderline personality disorder. She was a practitioner uh, or a meditator, and she said the emphasis in DBT or, or on her, uh, her what she taught, dialectical behavior therapy, the emphasis in, in dialectical behavior therapy on a balance of acceptance and change owes much to my experiences in studying meditation and Eastern spirituality. The DBT tenets of observing mindfulness and avoidance of judgment are all derived from the study and practice of Zen meditation. And so we see that mindfulness and acceptance-based interventions are examples of the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapies and the result is a call to redirect clinical practice away from treating syndromes and toward focusing on processes and core competencies. And this is one intervention that provides that for us. I want to ask you, some of you who've listened to me before can answer yes. Do you meditate? Have you ever tried to meditate? Do you meditate? Have you ever tried to meditate? Crystal Thomas says no. CEU code word for today, y'all listen up. The CEU code word, password for today's presentation is mindfulness with a capital M. Mindfulness, the full in mindfulness only has one L. M-I-N-D-F-U-L-N-E-S-S. -S mindfulness is our CEU code word. And it looks like we had a great response to that. Some of you have tried, some of you haven't. Meditation, for those of you who haven't tried it, is an investment. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything except time, but it's something that can be done in moments during the day or throughout the day. And meditation isn't easy. It's not easy for anyone to do, but it is available for everyone to try. And you don't have to change yourself to do meditation. You don't have to buy anything or go anywhere. You simply have to be. And you don't have to be good at meditation for meditation to be good for you. Just like you don't have to be an athlete to benefit from exercise. You don't have to be a guru to benefit from meditation. We've got about 12 minutes now. I'm gonna lead you all, those of you who've not been and choose to want to try. We're gonna try a simple meditation technique today. If you're sitting, I would ask you to put your feet firmly flat on the floor. You can let your arms rest at your side, fold them in your lap. Some people like their palms up. Some people like palms down. It really doesn't matter. You can lay down on your back comfortably if you're able to, if you're working from home. Or you can walk around the room very intentionally. However you situate yourself, know that you can walk, stand, lay, sit. You can be in any position and meditate. We would ask you to be comfortable, to be comfortably erect in a balanced position. You don't have to be ramrod straight. Just try not to lean forward or lean back. And now, if you will, with your feet on the ground, your hands beside you or in your lap, close your eyes 
and say to yourself, may I be truly happy and free from suffering. May I be truly happy and free from suffering. May I be truly happy and free from suffering. Come aware of the movement of your breath inwards and outwards, the level of your nostrils, breathing naturally and easily, not holding your breath, not forcing your breath, breathing naturally in, comfortably out. Feel the breath move through the tip of your nostril and feel it exit the tip of your nostril when you breathe out. Focus on the breath moving in and moving out. And at the same time, let go of any thoughts. Constantly bring your mind back to your breathing. Breathing comfortably in, and comfortably out. Feeling the air touch your nostrils as it goes into your body. Feel it touch your nostrils as it leaves your body. As you focus on your breath, entering and leaving your body, see how deeply into your nose you can feel the breath travel. And try and pick up that sensation. Again, when you breathe out, breathing comfortably, breathing in, breathing out. Don't worry about it. Even if you find your attention wandering, there's no particular thing you have to hold on to. Just let go and drift in the awareness of the blessing of your breath moving in and out of your body, focusing on your breathing, following the sensation of your breath in and out. The secret is not to think about thoughts but to allow them to flow through the mind while keeping your mind free of afterthoughts as you focus on the breathing in, breathing out comfortably, normally. Whatever you find yourself thinking, let that thought rise and settle without any constraint. Don't grasp at the thought. Don't feed the thought. Don't indulge the thought. Don't cling to the thought. And don't try to solidify the thought. Feel the breath passing in and out of your nostrils. Chase your breath through your nasal passage down to your esophagus, into your trachea. Can you feel your breath moving through your body? Focus on your breathing. Breathing inward, outward. Feel the flow of air. Enter and leave your body. There is only one law in the universe that never changes. That law is that all things change and all things are impermanent. You can't find happiness in the past or in the future. The 
past is gone and your memory of it is undependable. The future is a blank uncertainty. So the only place you can really find happiness is in the present, here and now, feeling our breath moving inward and outward of our body as we feel the sensation of our breathing and let go of our thinking, focusing only on our breath. What is born will die. What has been gathered will be dispersed. What has been accumulated will be exhausted. What has been built up will collapse. And what has been high will be brought low. What we have to learn in meditation and in life is to be free of attachment to the good experiences and free of aversion from the bad experiences. We do this by focusing on our breath, breathing in, breathing out comfortably. Feel the sensation of our breath moving in and out. Do you notice there are particular moments when you are naturally inspired to introspection? Work with them gently. But these are the moments when you can go through a powerful experience and your whole worldview can change quickly. Perhaps this moment is such a moment. Open your eyes. Thank you for being here today. I hope you enjoyed that exercise. I hope it's one that you can repeat if you did enjoy it. Our CEU code word, which is necessary, necessary to log into Survey Monkey, is mindfulness with a capital M and one L in mindfulness. Capital M I N D F U L N E S S. Everyone who does an evaluation will get a certificate of completion. Hopefully by tonight, I'd like everyone to finish their evaluations by eight tonight. I've included here on the screen, if you can see it, a link for Friday's presentation when we do therapy for self-harm. I know Fridays are busy for many of us, but I hope you can join us then. We'll be loading the nursing hours up to the ABN website here this week. Our Survey Monkey website code is here listed for you. I'll read it one last time if you need it. It's https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters. B is in boy, G is in girl, G is in girl, S, five, W, Z as in zoo. Thank you for your referrals to Care Patrol. Our number's on the screen. If you know someone who needs help with aging choices or care, 855-980-2250. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being here today. Please do join us Friday when we present therapy for self-harm and have a great rest of your week.